All right, now we're heading into the second part of this lecture series, um, and we're going to talk about the chemical context of life here. Well, there's four, four mini lectures associated with this. So chemistry, right? Uh, here we are in a biology class, and most of you are taking this class because you thought, I don't want to take chemistry. I don't want to take physics. I want to take biology because it's neither chemistry or physics. Well, the joke is totally on you because it turns out you have to understand some basic physics and you have to understand some basic chemistry to understand biology at all. So this lecture series, along with the next one on macromolecules, is going to form the absolute basis of the knowledge that we're going to build in this course. Without understanding chemistry, you won't be able to understand the larger um, aspects of biology. So I'm going to teach you chemistry as if you've never heard anything about chemistry in your entire life. So I'm starting from the base and I'm going to work my way up. And we're going to start with the most basic, which are terms. So matter. Matter is just anything that occupies space and takes up room. Uh, matter can be described in two ways. You can describe its composition. That is what it's made of. Um, in this example, you see it's the composition of that uh, molecule. You've got three components to it. Two of them are hydrogen. One of them is oxygen, and they come together to form a molecule of water. So you're describing what makes that molecule. Properties, on the other hand, describe qualities or attributes. As you can see, that's a banana. Bananas are um, yellow. Bananas are smooth. Bananas are, I don't know, tasty. If you were to describe its composition, you might talk about its potassium. You might talk about sugar levels, uh, what makes it up. But the properties are it's sweet, it's yellow, it's small, and so on. Um, uh, bananas. So with bananas, people oftentimes think bananas are slippery. Uh, I would like to attest that banana peels are not terribly slippery. I have tried on many occasions to um, slip on a banana peel for the sake of humor. And I'll tell you, it's... They're just not terribly slippery. They just make a mess, really. They're kind of splatter everywhere. There are three states of matter that we are concerned with in biology, and you've probably heard these before. Uh, solids, liquids, and gases. There's a the fourth state all, that's called plasma, not to be mistaken for blood plasma. Um, we'll get into that in a second, but solids, liquids, and gases. The difference between these states is how uh, tightly packed the components of that matter are, or how much kinetic energy is there, how much motion is happening between those components. Solids, the components are very, very, very tightly packed together. They're not moving anywhere. There's no room for movement. So there's little movement, very, very tightly packed. It also means it's very dense. A solid can melt, uh -huh, you know that term, into a liquid. With liquids, there's a little bit more energy, a little bit more energy of motion, and the um, components are not as tightly packed together. And then as a liquid gets more energy, it's going to vaporize and become a gas. Gases have a lot of energy. They're moving around an awful, the, the individual components are moving around an awful lot, and they also um, uh, are, are very widely dispersed. Now you can move in the other direction as well. You can go from a gas to a liquid. Going from a gas to a liquid is called condensation, which you've probably heard of when people talk about rain. Uh, it's condensation or condensation forming on the outside of a glass. If you were to put cold water in a glass in a hu on a humid day, water droplets will form outside in the form of condensation. Those water droplets are not, um, I don't know, seeping out of the gas, uh, the glass that you poured. Instead, the water droplets are the molecule or the, the, the pieces of water that are in the atmosphere cooling down enough, condensing enough to form droplets on the outside of the glass. Um, once you have liquids, you can um, freeze them, remove some energy. The, the energy of those components gets slower and slower and slower until they're very tightly packed together and not moving. So solids, liquids, gases. Uh, the most common example we could use is water. Water goes uh, is ice as a solid. 
to liquid water as a gas to water va I'm sorry, liquid water to um, water vapor as a gas. The last state that we do not need to discuss in biology is plasma. It's a very high energy level. It's basically what the sun is made of. Um, if a biological organism came in contact with plasma, they would uh, instantly be killed. So we don't have any real use for talking about plasma in biology. You talk about that in chemistry and a, a lot more in physics. Now, some matter can be broken down into its constituent parts, into the individual pieces that make it up. In front of you, what you see is um, it, it's obviously going to become some kid's playground. Uh, what I want you to focus on is that structure, that sort of, uh, sort of center there. It's got yellow bars going across it. And I want to ask you, what do you think those yellow bars are for? Now, if I was in class, I get all sorts of um, comments. Um, it might be, it, it's reasonable to think that that could be monkey bars. You have these above your head, you can grab on and then sort of monkey across. And monkeying apparently is a verb now. Um, if it was vertical, straight up and down, maybe that's a ladder to get onto the equipment. If it was placed sideways, perpendicular to the ground, maybe it's a, um, a, a guard railing. Dictates the function of that piece is its placement, is what I'm trying to get at. Depending on where these constituent components are in a larger structure, they have different attributes and they do different things. And I want you to keep that in mind as we go more and more into different chemical equations and chemical formula and structural uh, images. The placement of the individual piece will oftentimes change its properties and attributes. So we can break down these, uh, break down matter into individual pieces. Like we've mentioned before, we have a, a, a molecule of water here. Water itself can be broken uh, down into two components, oxygen and hydrogen. If you've combined oxygen and hydrogen into water, you can have a, a, a water molecule, um, you break them apart and you have hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Now, you'll notice that the constituent parts have entirely different properties than the, uh, the whole that they come together to create. For example, water is most famously a liquid oxygen, at room temperature. Oxygen and hydrogen are gases. So you've got oxygen, hydrogen gas, water, liquid. Um, how could you describe water? You might describe water as uh, not flammable, uh, I guess, unless you're along the James River or something where, uh, you know, there's been pollution for decades and there are probably portions of it that you can light on fire. But oxygen and hydrogen, they're extremely flammable. You might go down a neighborhood and see um, people with uh, oxygen tanks next to them and it says, danger, do not smoke. And some of those people are, you know, out there smoking because they're at that age where, they're going to go and do whatever they feel like doing. Um, <laughs> so you've got different properties. Water is, is not flammable. Oxygen and hydrogen are flammable. They're both, um, th you've got lots of different properties going on by breaking these things apart. So the components have different properties than the whole. So what are these components? First, we'll talk about atoms. Um, atoms are, are these components that can't be broken down any further and retain their properties. They are the smallest functional unit of matter, and they're going to make up all chemical substances. There are three pieces that make up the atom. So these pieces are called subatomic because they are below the level of the atom. The subatomic particles are protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are positively charged. Think both start with P. Neutrons are neutrally charged, so they have zero charge to them. And electrons are negatively charged. So as we said, protons each have one unit of positive charge. 
The important thing to note about protons is that the number of protons in any element, in any of a particular type of atom, are identical. All hydrogen atoms will have one proton, and no other type of atom uh, will have a single proton in it. All helium atoms have two protons. If that helium lost a proton, it would become hydrogen. The element is identified by the number of protons. And those protons live in the center of the atom, known as the atomic nucleus. So that gives the atomic nucleus a net positive charge. Neutrons, on the other hand, are electrically neutral. They have net zero charge. And you could have all sorts of different numbers of neutrons in the atomic nucleus at any given time. Um, if, if, if in, uh, let's take uh, helium, well, let's take hydrogen. Hydrogen could have um, zero neutrons and one proton, and it's still hydrogen. It could have one proton and one neutron and still be hydrogen. It could have one proton and two neutrons and still be hydrogen. Um, but as soon as it picks up one more proton, now it's uh, helium. So you can change the number of neutrons in an atom, and it will retain its uh, um, chemical identity. These neutrons, like the proton, are also in the nucleus. Um, so they give the nucleus mass, but because they have zero charge, they do not give it any additional charge. So basically, they just build out mass. If an item has, if an atom, if an item, uh, if an atom has varying numbers of neutrons, it's going to be called an isotope. So varying numbers of neutrons would be one proton and one neutron, one proton and two neutrons, one proton and three neutrons. Those are all different isotopes of hydrogen. And then we have electrons. Electrons each have one unit of negative charge. So we have positive with the protons, zero, uh, neutral with the neutrons, and negative with the electrons. In any uh, electrically neutral atom, so when the electrical charge of the atom is zero, the number of protons has to equal the number of, uh, of electrons. Protons and electrons have to balance each other out. Now where the neutrons and the protons were living in the atomic nucleus, the electrons live outside the atomic nucleus in what's called the electron cloud. So this is where they're constantly moving. They're not staying still. And they're moving at very close to the speed of light. Um, so this gives the electron cloud a net negative charge compared to the inside of the atom, which has a net positive charge. The mass of the subatomic particles is really way too small to be um, measured in grams. Uh, grams is our standard unit of measurement in the metric system. Way too small. Uh, so instead, we're going to use this term called atomic mass, uh, atomic mass units, AMUs. Daltons could also be used, named after Dr. Dalton, but usually AMU is what you use to measure the mass of an atom or a molecule. Um, one AMU is roughly 1.7 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. That number is almost incomprehensibly small, but I'll try and put it into perspective. If you think of the weight of a single feather, um, some you know, if you have a pillow and the feather came out, you find a feather on the ground, a small feather, not a big feather. Um, the weight of one feather compared to the weight of the entire Earth, including all of the mountains, all of the seas, all of the rocks, the entire Earth's core. The mass of that compared to the mass of a single feather is roughly the same as the difference in scale between the mass of a feather and the mass of one uh, AMU. It's an enormously small number, to put it a different way. It's so small it's almost incomprehensibly tiny. And then, going even smaller, you have the, um, the electron. Protons and neutrons each weigh one atomic mass unit. Electrons weigh one, uh, I think it's 1,876, uh, sorry, 1,836 uh, 1, of an AMU. So one electron is almost 2,000 times smaller than a, um, 
than a proton or a neutron. So when we're measuring the, num uh, the mass of a molecule or the mass of an atom, we use the unit, atomic mass unit. We talked about charges. Protons and neutrons have different charges. Protons are positively charged. Electrons are negatively charged. A sort of universal rule that, uh, we, that holds in most situations is that opposites attract. Positive charges are attracted to negative charges. Um, so protons and electrons are attracting each other. If they have a same charge, they repel each other. And this is what allows the atom to retain its structure. The electrons and the uh, the electrons are attracted to the protons while at the same time moving forward uh, very, very, very quickly. So they're instead of flying off the uh, atom, the electrons move in a straight line but are being pulled down toward the electrons. So they circle. Um, it's the same way an orbiter orbits the Earth. You're moving forward very quickly and being pulled down at about the same rate. The modern model of the atom is going to be, have the electron, I'm sorry, the electrons on the outside in the electron cloud and the protons and the neutrons on the inside of the atomic nucleus. The electrons on the outside um, in that shell are, let's say, they have a high probability of being found there. Um, there's some areas that are denser than other areas, which means that you're just more likely to find electrons there. But we've altered our model of what the, um, the atom looks like. It's gone from this sort of bread pudding model to this mixed model to uh, spheres, housed within spheres, to this complex shell. It's really hard to get information about, or to remember all this information about all of the elements. There are more than 100 elements, each with their own unique um, number of protons, their own unique atomic mass, their own, um, and, and, and all of this information is just very difficult to memorize. Plus, there's information about, I don't know, how big that electron shell is for any given element, or um, how many electrons it has that it can use to bind with things. So instead of trying to memorize everything, scientists have conveniently come up with these atomic symbols to represent a lot of information about the, um, the atom, about the element. So if we look here, you can see this HE with a four at the top and a two at the bottom. The smaller number, I don't care if it's at the top or the bottom, the smaller number you see with that element is the atomic number. That is the number of protons. Every single atom of the same element has the same atomic number. All helium has atomic number of two because all helium have two protons. The other number, the bigger number, is the atomic mass. The atomic mass is the average mass of the sum of the protons and neutrons in each atom. And uh, the reason that it's weird is uh, it might have decimals or things like that is because it takes into account the naturally occurring isotopes of that element. In general, in this class, we're going to round to the nearest whole number, usually. So our atomic number here is two. That means that there are two protons. Our atomic mass is four. That means that we have a grand total mass in the um, uh, the atom of four AMU. Well, we know two AMU comes from the number of protons, so the other two must come from the number of neutrons. So four minus two, the atomic mass minus the atomic number, will give you the number of neutrons present. Um, in general, we ignore the mass of the electron because it is 1,836 1, of the mass of any of the um, other component subatomic particles. So atomic mass minus atomic number gives you the number of neutrons. The atomic number gives you the number of protons. And the atomic number will also give you the number of electrons in an electrically neutral atom. 
So we get all of this information from just that symbol. Scientists have taken all the symbols, all the information for all of the elements, and put them into this handy-dandy table called the periodic table of elements. So an element is an atom. It's, it's a not an atom. An element is a pure substance made up of a single type of atom. And all of the elements are listed on this table. Whenever I give you a test, whenever I give you anything, you will have access to a periodic table of elements so that you can easily get information. And what I'm going to show you over the next several slides is basically how to use the periodic table of elements. We're going to focus in particularly on four elements. These are four elements that we use more often than any other element in biology. 95% of the total mass of all living organisms is oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. All the rest of the, the you are made up of other elements, but 95% of you is just these four in, put together in different forms. Obviously, the image is just a drawing. Uh, it, it's not... Um, Look, people, so I have to, I, it's sad that I have to explain this, but like the lower half of your body is not made up of hydrogen. Uh, it's spread throughout. It's not like your brain is where you keep all your carbon. This is just an infographic I found or I created, and um, I, I am uh, disappointed when people are like, well, obviously I keep all my oxygen half in my face and half in my, lump, I don't know, shoulders. So just be aware. As I mentioned earlier, there are four. Uh, there's we we talked about differences in the number of neutrons. Um, an atom of the same element with varying neutrons is called an isotope. And here we see protium, deuterium, and tritium, three isotopes of hydrogen. The first one has a proton in the center and an electron uh, circling it. So it's got an atomic number of one because there is one proton and an atomic mass of one because there is one proton and nothing else, and one proton weighs one AMU, so zero neutrons. The deuterium next to it, you've got a proton and a neutron as well as an electron. So the proton, the single proton, identifies it as hydrogen. It's still hydrogen. Um, the atomic mass of two tells you that there is two minus one, one neutron but it's still hydrogen. And then tritium has two neutrons and one proton, giving it an atomic mass of three, and again, an atomic number of one. Each of these are hydrogen, but they all weigh different atomic masses. They all have different atomic masses um, and are thus isotopes. And we can use isotopes for a lot of different things. Radioactive isotopes are um, unstable. They release particles and energy to enter into a more stable state. Those are emissions that can easily be detected. So we can see using some um, uh, imaging equipment, these radioactive particles. It's becoming very, very important for medical imaging technology. Uh, on the left, you have Marie Curie. She was the woman who discovered radioactive particles. She discovered them by, um, she noticed that this rock was warm which means it's constantly giving off energy. She surrounded that rock with a film. And that film, when she developed it, had little sparks on it because the rock was emitting particles that struck the film. She noticed that when she put a lead box around the rock, it was no longer emitting, uh, the, the sparks didn't form on the film anymore. She found that lead blocked radiation. Unfortunately for her, she didn't understand the dangers of radiation until it was too late, um, and she ended up dying of um, multiple cancers. So we've talked about protons, we've talked about neutrons, now let's talk about electrons. Electron orbitals are the region around the nucleus where you're very likely to find electrons. They are moving extraordinarily quickly, they're moving in these orbits, they're circling the um, the the nucleus, but um, we don't know. It, it's it's hard to mathematically predict where you will find them. 
instead of looking at this very complex uh, mathematical construct of where an electron is, in this class, we can look at a very, very simplified path of the electrons. Now, please note the image you see on the screen with valence shells on the outside and these circles, these shells, is not the way it works in real life. Um, they're not orbiting the atom like, I don't know, the rings of Saturn. Um, they don't even just go in a straight circle. They're constantly moving in all sorts of directions. It's very hard to predict. But for this course, because you're in biology and not in physics, we can talk about this uh, structure here where it looks like there are varying shells. Um, it's an easier way of viewing the atom, and it, for our purposes, will help us understand how atoms will come together to form molecules. Now, what I want you to note about this image is that there are shells, um, circle, these, these orbits. The lower orbits get filled first with electrons, like almost like you're pouring a glass of water. The water goes to the bottom of the glass first and then fills up to the top. Um, each of these shells can hold a certain number of electrons. The first shell, the one that's closest to the nucleus, will hold two electrons. And then as you move farther out, it will hold eight. Um, and uh, the, the outer shell will hold a total of eight electrons. Now, if you've taken chemistry, you know I am oversimplifying this. I think it's like it goes 8, 16, 32, 64, 64, some, yeah, anyways. Um, but for us in this class, two in the first shell, eight in the following shells. You can use the periodic table to tell you how many shells there are in an atom and also tell you how many valence electrons there are. You can first count the number of rows. Those are the horizontal uh, uh, groups on this table. If you count down the number of rows, it will tell you how many uh, shell, valence shells there are, how many shells are in an atom that can hold electrons. Um, for instance, hydrogen and helium are in the first row. So they have a single um, shell. The next row has lithium, beryl uh, uh, yeah, beryl uh, boron, carbon, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. They all have two shells because they are in the second row. And you can go down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different, uh, a total of seven possible shells. Uh, the lanthanide series and the actinide series at the bottom, they fit in um, right at element 57, lan uh, lanthium, and down at 89, uh, actinium. actinum. Um, so it's as if they have six and seven shells, respectively. You can figure out the number of valence electrons, electrons that are in that outer shell by counting across the number of columns. Column one has one valence electron. Column two has two valence electrons. And then you skip that big sort of dip in the middle, go all the way to the very, uh, the next one, which would be um, boron, which would have three valence electrons. Carbon has four, because we're counting across the number of columns. One, two, skip a few. Three, four is carbon. Uh, nitrogen has three valence electrons, and everything, I'm sorry, has one, two, three, four, five valence electrons, uh, as well as everything below nitrogen. Um, oxygen has six, Flor fluorine has um, seven, and then neon, helium, argon, krypton, and so on, xenon have um, eight. So you can count the number of columns in order to understand how many valence electrons there are. You can count the number of uh, rows to figure out the number of shells there are. And then this slide is probably extraordinarily important for the course. Uh, it's important to note that most chemical reactions involve electrons moving between higher and lower energy levels. As an atom gains, elect uh, as an atom gains energy, the electron cloud expands because those electrons speed up a little. So they move a little farther away from the nucleus. As it loses energy, the electron cloud contracts. So energy is going to be stored in the motion of those electrons. 
And as we start to build bonds, which is the next lecture, we're going to store that energy in the bonds of those atoms, um, the bonds of the molecules. So looking forward to the next lecture where we talk about how you can put um, atoms together to form molecules and store energy. But remember, energy comes into an atom, the electron cloud expands because you have an energized electron. That will be very important for later in the course. There you go, all about the very, very basis of chemistry, starting from what matter is, which is anything that occupies space and taking up room, to the three states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases, separated by how fast the molecules are moving in that area, how far apart they are. We talked about uh, matter being made of constitutive elements, um, atoms, and the atoms themselves are made of subatomic particles like protons, neutrons, and electrons. Um, protons being positively charged and having one unit of mass, neutrons being neutrally charged and having zero units of mass, and electrons being negatively charged with uh, a, a negative, yeah, negative charge with uh, negligible mass. So we don't include them in mass discussions. Um, atoms with the same number of protons but different number of neutrons are termed isotopes, and then all num atoms with the same number of protons, which is the atomic number. Um, are of the same type of element. So the atomic number defines, I'm sorry, the number of protons defines the element. The protons and neutrons are found in the atomic nucleus. The electrons are found in the electron cloud surrounding the nucleus, giving the nucleus a net positive charge and the uh, electron cloud a net negative charge. And then of course, when an atom gains energy, the electrons speed up and that expands the electron cloud. Um, and that in the future is going to be what we use, that energetic electron is what we use to move energy through any biological system. So there we go, end of this uh, first bit of mini lecture. Um, content, these content review questions are here to focus your, your studying. There's a lot in this lecture. It is foundational to the rest of the course, so please understand this lecture. Come back to it a few times if you need. I'm here if you have uh, concerns. Um, I hope you stay, stay tuned for the next lecture where we will go in depth on how molecules are uh, created through atoms binding to each other.